Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and this week I have been incredibly busy dismantling my own Dinosaur Juice V8 from the Pantera. And so it's quite fitting that there have been a load of really important announcements from various manufacturers. Now for years I have been watching what appeared to be the inevitable downfall of the petrol combustion engine. And this week I have been reading some really interesting articles and they're leading on to what appears to be the phoenix-like rise back of the petrol engine. So there is an article here in um, Piston Heads, which I saw a couple of days ago. Basically it's entitled Renault and Geely saddle up for horse powertrain. It says worried about the future of engines, announcements from Japan and now Europe and China suggest that you needn't be. Now the article goes on to say that it's been a significant week for internal combustion. It seemed for a while like its fate had been sealed only for legislation to be variously rolled back amid discontented murmurings about the timescales and proportional lack of EV demand. This last bit is crucial, we'll talk about it a bit more later. In addition to news that some of the firms were delaying progress on additional electric advancements, some have gone even further. In just the past few days, five global manufacturers have underlined their commitment to the future of suck, squeeze, bang, blow in one form or another. A lot of stuff to unpack here. Just before we do, I'm going to tell you a little bit more detail about the announcements, both from the Japanese manufacturers, but also now from Chinese and European in the form of Renault and Geely. So earlier in the week, Toyota, Subaru and Mazda came together to state that as part of a decarbonisation push and driven like this is just by a deep understanding of their customers' diverse lifestyles. If this isn't just marketing bullcrap, I don't know what is. But anyway, all three, this is the crucial bit, will continue to develop signature engines. That means that Pretty much we can guarantee there's going to be a new generation of inline fours, i.e. Toyota, boxer engines from Subaru, and even the rotary from Mazda. The newcomers will be much more efficient and smaller than we're used to, boosted by the integration of electric drive units. But reduced cubic capacity means a lower bonnet, opening up new design possibilities as well as better aero performance. And all of this is absolutely crucial to what I want to talk to you about once we've gone through the content of the article. It says that moreover, all the new units will be designed to run on e-fuel, biofuel and hydrogen. Toyota in particular has been keen to push the latter in motorsport of late. I wasn't really sure of that. I'll have a look online. I hadn't heard much. Their CEO stated, in order to provide our customers with diverse options to achieve carbon neutrality, it's necessary to take on the challenge of evolving engines that are in tune with the energy environment of the future. Okay, then just, okay, hot, you know, waffle. But the other next crucial bit, horse powertrain is to produce a complete portfolio of state-of-the-art Powertrain technologies for global partners, including hybrid systems, internal combustion engines, transmissions, and battery solutions. Now, this is a joint venture between Geely and Renault. And they already have agreements in place to supply Volvo, Nissan, Proton, and Mitsubishi. So already here, we are starting to go from just a handful, I think three manufacturers, last week who announced the Japanese and now we're on to test 10 plus manufacturers that are going back to the combustion engine. They say that Renault Group and Geely believe that a combination of various powertrain technologies is necessary, in absolutely right, including highly efficient internal combustion engines, lower carbon e-fuels and hydrogen to successful decarbonization blah 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 by 2040. Now, just to give you an idea of the scale of this, it will include 17 global power plants. So that means that it's expected to get 15 billion of yearly revenues, and they'll include engines that can be powered by ethanol, methanol, hydrogen, LPG, compressed natural gas, and hydrogen, plus hybrids, FEVs, so pretty comprehensive. 
So why is this so significant? Because it confirms that the transition from internal combustion to electric powertrains has been completely mismanaged by government. This is confirmed by what I said earlier, that demand for electric vehicles has fallen drastically, which is what is leading to these new announcements. Let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, why has demand fallen? And here, there is a real big issue. One of the reasons is that electric cars that have been produced have been of the wrong kind. We should be aiming for cars that are lighter, more efficient. We shouldn't have pivoted to going to bigger and bigger batteries in order to achieve electric cars that can be usable. This has huge downsides. It means that they are bigger, they are heavier. You get more pollution from particles, such as one which has come out recently, which is rubber particles more damage to the roads, it makes absolutely no sense the direction we've gone in. So, the cars that have come out are more expensive, they're heavier, they're more energy intensive, they go against everything that we're trying to do in order to decarbonize. Why has this happened? It's happened because when the legislation from the EU came in, on electric vehicles, the German manufacturers lobbied hard for there not to be any penalties with regard to the car's size or weight. Now, Germany has always produced cars which were much more bigger cars and more on the expensive side, whereas perhaps Italy, France have produced smaller, more economical cars. Now, the German manufacturers were really worried, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, very worried that if the wrong legislation came in, they would be disadvantaged because cheaper, smaller cars is not their traditional sector. They lobbied very effectively, and as such, the legislation that came in from the EU didn't concentrate on overall efficiency of cars, just on CO2 emissions. This meant that all manufacturers were then incentivized to try and produce and make big heavy cars, because there are bigger margins, more money on those. The knock-on effect of this is that manufacturers went in completely the wrong direction. Now, BMW started in the right direction with the i3 and the i8. If you think back, those two were absolutely brilliant. Now, the i3 was completely revolutionary. It was a car that wasn't very big. It was light, it was made with one of the first carbon fiber tubs, certainly in a car of that sector. They had a range extender version as well, which is what we are talking about now with these new releases, these smaller hybrid engines. Essentially, they are becoming almost like range extenders. So they're a car that looked different, that was looking, you know, it was forward looking, it was made for the future. And although they did sell some, I don't think it was as successful as it should. Certainly that is true of the i8. BMW looked at what a sports car for the future could be. And they concentrated on new technologies, on lightweight. They had a car which had very good miles to the gallon, which looked great and which drove pretty well. And yet, within a year of coming out, those had lost 50% of their value. So BMW has replaced neither of those ranges. Instead, we're looking at things like Taycan's, the Audi e-tron. You know, they're great cars, um, but they weigh, what, two and a half tons? It really, usually to transport one person, we have gone from petrol cars in the 60s and 70s that used to weigh seven, 800 kilos to transport one person <laughs> to cars that weigh four times as much. Now, I know that there are limitations now because of safety and so on, but when you get into bigger batteries, it's just a self-perpetuating thing. Bigger batteries, bigger brakes, bigger tires, etc. And the weights just go up and up. We need to concentrate on weight first, and cars need to be taxed on weight. So, I've gone through quite a big range of things here, but this new announcement about petrol engines is hugely you know, welcome, because in any case, it doesn't make sense to become so dependent on one mode of propulsion, just on electric. There is always going to be a place, I think a limited place, but there is always going to be a place for the internal combustion engine. So the fact that now a lot of manufacturers are going back and doing that is great news. Don't forget 
what happened to the fabled diesel? I'm not saying it's the same with electric cars because I don't think they are gonna go away. But just go back 15, 20 years and the diesel was touted as the savior of the auto industry. Governments really incentivized the production of diesels. And then within 10 years, diesel was, you know, enemy number one because they'd found out that there were different types of emissions which were just as probably more harmful than on normal petrol engines. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. Tell me what you think because I don't know, you know, will these new units catch on? Smaller, compact, technologically advanced with, you know, the backup of, um, you know, of electricity as well. Is that going to be the way forward perhaps? Maybe electric only is really going to die off. I don't know. Let me know what you think and I'll see you for the next video.